Party of England and Wales, um, Simo Retila, um, a PhD student from Finland who is specialised in social policy and basic income and is also a green activist as well. And also Juan Kim, the former leader of the Korean Green Party and a basic income activist. So I'm very briefly going to introduce the topic and then pass it back to Amy, who's going to explain how the rest of the session will uh, be organized and then, uh, and then we'll get started. So our topic today is basic income, universal basic income. And I'll just start with a brief definition so we all know what we're talking about. So basic income is a proposal um, for everyone to receive some form of cash payment from the government on a regular basis. And the important thing about it is that it's universal, so everyone should receive it, and it's unconditional. So it doesn't matter how much you earn, how, uh, how old you are, the proposal is that everyone should receive this. It's a very simple idea, but that's the proposal. And it's a proposal that's been gaining uh, increasing support and uh, prominence in recent years. Um, it's often in the press, and there are more and more advocates for it. And it's also been tried around the world. So in countries such as Finland, in parts of Spain, in Canada, and many other places, it's been uh, tested by government. And there are more and more um, movements and also governments looking at uh, how it would work in practice. So why is it gaining this prominence? Um, well, there are many different reasons. And many people, um, different people see basic income as a solution to different issues whether it's poverty, uh, whether it's lack of work due to uh, the changing nature of our economy, whether it's um, the punitive welfare state systems, or whether it's um, the unequal division of both formal and uh, non-formal work um, between men and women. So there are many different reasons to support basic income. And it's also worth saying that not all forms or supports of basic income may be considered progressive payroll. Um, to sum up, I'd say the basic income debate is uh, one where the big questions are there and they really matter, um, such as are we truly free if we need to uh, work to get by or if we didn't have to work, would we? And it's also one where the details matter. How much would a basic income be and what would it mean for the rest of the welfare state that we have in place? Um, so basic income and interest in it is not a limited to green parties, but it's definitely true that green movements have long debated and often supported basic income, and they see it as a path towards a more sustainable way of living. And that's why we're delighted to have our three speakers with us today. Um, and now I'll hand it back over to Amy to uh, explain how the session will be organized. Terrific, thanks Jamie. Um, yes, so I'm Amy Tyler, Global Greens Executive Secretary. I'm Australian, which is my accent you can probably hear, and living in Los Angeles. Uh, we also have Kelly Yen, who is the Global Greens convener on the call. Um, so that's fantastic, and she's listening and helping out as well. Uh, so we're really excited to co-host this webinar. Um, what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be structuring it is Jamie will introduce the speakers who will speak to their expertise on the topic, uh, I think for around five minutes or so each, and then we're thinking we'll hold the questions until after the speakers have finished, and at that time we'll hopefully have a good 20 to 30 minutes for a robust discussion around this topic. Now the way that the questions work with this tool is there are two ways. You can either pop your question in the chat box and I'll, I'll keep a, a close eye on that and try and capture all of the questions. And then what I'll do is that I'll call on you to ask your question of Jamie or directly to the speaker that you'd like to respond or have that conversation with. And I'll do that by unmuting you. You can see that at the moment, everyone should be muted except myself and Jamie at this stage who are speaking. So I'll unmute you. You can then ask your question and we'll go from there and Jamie will moderate that discussion. He might cut, it might be that there's more discussion to be had, but for the sake of other people asking questions, he might say, okay, we'll, we'll move on now. Um, so uh, the other way you can ask a question is to, you should see a little hand in your options. You can raise your hand. And at that point, I will call on you um, to ask a question when we, when we have the chance. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to let everybody know is that we are recording this webinar because a lot of people, given the nature of 
that we're global. A lot of people wanted to attend, but the time zones didn't work for them. So we will be recording it and then posting it onto our Facebook page. Um, I think that that is everything that we need to know for housekeeping. So let's get started. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll just get straight underway and I'll ask um, Natalie to, um, to join us and uh, present the conversation around basic income in the, in the UK. I'm not on mute anymore. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just so if you don't have to sit there wondering, if you're thinking, gosh, Natalie sounds rather like Amy. Yes, I was born and grew up in Australia, so the accent is very similar. But I live in the UK now, and I was leader of the Green Party of England and Wales from 2012 to 2016, and I still do full-time Green Party politics. Um, and over that period of time, starting in 2012 to the present day, we've seen a huge change in the debate on basic income in England and Wales and indeed across the whole United Kingdom. When I first became leader in 2012, it had already been Green Party policy to back universal basic income, which we also called citizens' income, for many decades. But we didn't talk about it very much because we were very out there on our own and hardly anyone else was talking about it. That utterly transformed. I think we played a part in that in the 2015 election campaign. It became a major part of the debate, but there was also much civil society interest rising up. And we're in a situation now where in Scotland, um, which is, a, of course, a separate king, a country as well as part of the United Kingdom with its own parliament, from four, gra four groups, grassroots groups in local government areas in Scotland, got together and said they want to run a trial. And the Royal Society of Arts is helping to organise that trial, which is planned to start pretty soon. So there's a huge level of interest in the UK in this. And if you ask why that is, and why perhaps it's been particularly strong in the UK, it's because we have really extreme neo-capitalist, extreme shareholder model capitalism forms. And so many people are deeply insecure. We have very low wages. Many people are stuck on zero hours contracts where they don't know each week how much money they'll make. And we also have very, very difficult, uh, threatening benefit sanctions. So people who are receiving benefits, who that's the only income they have, are at risk of losing them at any time, often through no fault of their own. So there are lots of people being left absolutely penniless. And this is something that people are increasingly saying is not right. So I'd say a lot of the argument in the UK is based on a human rights type argument that says we accept the right to life, but right to life implies food, shelter, clothing, and we're not guaranteeing people access to those things. Now, I was asked to address why is this specific Green Party issue? Why is it that the Green Party of England and Wales has been in favour of this for decades? Natalie? Well, I think Yep. I might just, um, it's just, a, the sound is just a little bit muffled for us. So I might just ask you to speak a little bit louder and a little bit closer to the microphone. All right, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Does that sound better? I think that's better. Yeah, is that, I see Jamie nodding as well. So I think let's okay. go. All right, sorry about that. That's good. Um, so, so why is this specifically a Green Party policy? Well, Insecurity, I would say, drives a lot of people's desire to acquire things. People feel very insecure about their income, about their future. They think if I get a better, a bigger house, that might be like my pension. If I need to keep my job, not lose it, not be left penniless, I need to have the right clothing, even have the right holidays. All of these things, this insecurity drives consumption. Whereas if you've got a cushion of security underneath you that universal basic income provides, you can choose to pursue a different kind of career, perhaps lower paid. You can choose perhaps to go part time. You can choose to live a different kind of life without the fear of being left with nothing, without the fear of ending up homeless, as we see so many increasing numbers of people homeless on our streets. There's also the fact, I think, that in the Green Party, we've always been aware that a focus on paid work as people's providing a foundation of people's place in society is a real problem for many different groups of people, particularly women, it's particularly a gender issue. Um, but that if 
you define people by their paid employment and that also determines their income, then that creates all sorts of difficulties. So that's the sort of green argument. Just finally, of course, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around automation and the fact that might take many jobs. And that's something that's very much part of the debate in the UK. I'm a little bit skeptical about that as an argument. There is also, of course, the argument from David Graeber about bullshit jobs, about many of the things that lots of us spend lots of our time doing aren't really worth doing at all now. And one of the things I'm often asked about universal basic income is how will you get people to do the really terrible jobs? And you know, one of my answers to that, if they're jobs that really need doing, let's say we need people to clean the sewers, well, maybe you'll pay those sewer cleaners a lot more than they pay now. Maybe you'll pay those sewer cleaners more than you pay bankers. And maybe we should pay the sewer cleaners more than we pay bankers. And maybe those kind of jobs, like in really terrible call centres, where people are timed on every call, timed when they go to the loo, uh, maybe those jobs, people uh, will refuse to do them at all uh, and choose to write poetry or start their own small business instead. And I'd suggest that might make our societies better off for all of us, not just for those people. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Natalie. Um, in fact, at the Green European Channel, Natalie, uh, just a couple of months ago, published an article about one of those uh, aspects that she discussed called basic income is a women's issue. Um, so thanks for that. And I think it's interesting bringing in the human rights perspective there. So I'd like to um, bring in our second contributor. I'm going to ask uh, Simon uh, Leitila to bring his point of view from Finland. Um, just today, um, Simon actually published an article on, um, on the Green European Journal as well about the future of basic income in Finland. Um, they've had pilots in the past. There was a change of government this year, so I'll leave it to him to um, update us about where it is uh, currently. Yeah, I think I have a lot to say. I will try and see if I can actually share some slides with you. Does this work? Yes, that's what I think, yeah. Getting them, yeah. So just if I can, yeah. So I will just try to quickly go through uh, kind of what the recent pilot study we had in Finland about basic income was and uh, why it was implemented in the way that it was and then kind of what we will expect going forward and kind of what the political situation on basic income in Finland is. So the pilot ran for two years from 2017 to 2018 and uh, each participant got 560 euros per month basic income there was no change in the taxes that they paid which meant that for if you got a job for example going from being unemployed to get 300 euros a month as your earnings you could still keep the basic income which is not kind of how we would normally see a realistic basic income model work and uh, there have only been research reports coming out from the year 2017 for now. So we are still waiting for the data on 2018 and that will be coming out next year. And even after that, we'll, there will still be probably for years kind of other studies coming out with the register linkage studies. Uh, there was also a phone, phone survey that was done in late 2018 of which the results of higher well-being and trust that have been so much publicized in the news have come from. Uh, there are certain issues with that that are being discussed in my article, uh, maybe in more detail. But the thing is that they found no significant employment effects. There was no difference between people who received the basic income uh, in whether they were found a job or not, if they were employed when they started getting the basic income. And uh, the motivation was exactly for the kind of the earlier right-wing government, which uh, was, has now changed into a left-wing government. Uh, their goal was to look at the effects of employment. The, the 
even though mostly kind of the things we would look at basic income as greens would be more of the well-being things. The idea, why we talk about basic income is because of the complexity of the Finnish welfare state and the multitudes of different benefits that are available. And basic income is seen as a solution to the changing working life, to precariousness, to kind of people changing from one status to another. And uh, for example, the, before the trial, the information was mainly, mainly kind of more kind of theoretical that you would have calculations on uh, how many people at certain incomes we have and if they would receive a basic income, how would the situation change? And uh, the political kind of background in the study was that the center party, which has in its history supported some form of basic income, and even, the, even in the elections now, after their kind of coalition government with the uh, uh, National Populist Finns Party and the uh, kind of conservative uh, national coalition. Even kind of after that government, they were still kind of talking and discussing their basic income model or kind of their welfare model in the words of basic income, even though it was condi conditional. And uh, this is some research that I did for the uh, article that has been published now. Uh, where we can see that when answering, answering a vote matcher, most of the selected members of parliament, actually, uh, even in the center party, which is supposedly pro-basic income, and which uh, as kind of near as a year ago, had their party members decide that they would want a second basic income trial. Uh, even their kind of politicians disagree with the idea of getting a, an unconditional basic income in the future in Finland. Most of their politicians, only the Greens and the left are kind of staunch supporters who kind of have gone on so for, for a longer time. Of course, the situation is in that way better that if we look at the parties in the government now, we have kind of a little bit higher support than would be otherwise, but still kind of in the whole parliament, only one in five MPs support the idea of basic income. Of course, that might be different in another context if you normally see numbers which are lower. And uh, the current government will do two main things. They will be do a negative income tax experiment, which will have a similar budget to the basic income trial. And uh, <clears throat> they will do a trial that tries to answer the things that were not being answered that well with uh, kind of last or kind of the last few years basic income trial. And uh, there is still kind of ongoing discussion in Finland. And uh, uh, especially it's, it would be nice to hear from Natalie kind of because many, of the bigger parties in Finland, they support some form of universal credit, meaning kind of a merger of benefits and uh, then kind of what is kind of uh, different, for example, for the social democrats and the national coalition, the conservatives, is uh, the amount of conditionality that they want to include in it. And for kind of Greens being in this situation, for example, or other kind of supporters of basic income. An interesting question is uh, how much we push, will push for kind of our idea when we are in the government with the other parties and kind of in cooperation and talking about uh, what kind of welfare state we finance should have in the future, or whether we will try to just push for unconditionality or less conditionality uh, and push for maybe basic income as a smaller benefit kind of as a part of that, for example. Uh, I could discuss it much longer, but I think I've discussed uh, more than uh, five minutes. So maybe I can uh, answer the questions then to kind of go further about these issues. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thanks for that, Simon. We have a first question for when we move into the question um, 
part of the debate in, the, in our second half. Um, so I'd just like to remind all the participants that if, if they have things that come into their minds um, as they're listening to our speakers, then please just uh, enter your questions in the chat box and then we'll come to them in a, in a few minutes. So um, I'd now like to introduce uh, our third speaker, um, Juan Kim, um, who uh, has been working um, to promote basic income in South Korea, um, a country that doesn't have a, a welfare state in the way that Finland does. So um, I'm sure that um, you can bring an interesting perspective on uh, promoting basic income as a principle uh, in a in a country that doesn't have that same uh, tradition of a uh, strong welfare state. Thank you, uh, Joan. Hi, I am Joan Kim. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm briefly uh, explain the situation in Korea first. After the 1997 financial crisis, neoliberalization of the economy and society took place rapidly. Workfare system has been introduced as an alternative to mass layoffs and unemployment, and such a welfare paradigm continues to today. And strong feminism, gender discrimination, environmental damage from developmentalism, and speculation on real estate are also a great part of its background. And basic living costs such as housing and education are soaring, while inequality and unemployment are extreme problems. Most young people study to have a job in the public sector for employment security. And youth are furious when they think that the value of fair competition and equality of opportunity has been violated. And Korea's debate on basic income began 10 years ago with a few discussions with researchers leftist and ecologist and then it emerged as a 2017 presidential election policy issue as the news of the swiss referendum and finnish pilot program arrived and that of the alphago shocked the society and recently it is being discussed through the introduction of youth basic income which is the representative policy of the governor of Gyeonggi province, the second largest city in Korea after Seoul. A quarter of Korean population lives there. So youth basic income is treated as a milestone on the way to the full UBI. On the other hand, because the governor, who is a strong supporter of UBI, has lots of political enemies, the agenda seems to be characterized as an individual politician's initiative and thus has not been able to extend to other regions or as a non-partisan issue. Um, Korea's basic income movement is led by an organization named uh, Basic Income Korean Network, an affiliate of Basic Income Earth Network, you know, BN, and together it conducts policy research, lectures, and campaigns including hosting the Basic Income Earth Network Congress in 2016. And my own activist group, Basic Income Youth Network, also has engaged a number of important endeavors to expand the diversity of these courses and to stimulate the imagination, such as creating contacts with feminist issues. And we think that basic income shouldn't be concentrated only on the path to make basic income a policy. Uh, we think its discourse should be more diversified and creative than that. And um, basic income in Korea now becomes an issue appearing in college interest exams, students' discussion assignments, or common sense quizzes. Awareness is much higher than before, but it has not become a public movement agenda, which is influencer enough to realize its goal. And the precarious debate has passed once, and the question remains, who should be the main actor in the basic income movement? 
And I want to talk more about the Green Party Korea. And in 2015, the Korean Green Party decided on basic income as the party's platform through an enthusiastic debate. In 2016, I, myself, as a basic income activist, ran as a proportional candidate for the general election and announced basic income as a campaign manifesto. A new topic has been thrown into the Korean society and basic income supporters were brought to the Green Party. And we said that basic income will be a medium to help change the society to an alternative sustainable society because it provides a basic safety net for individuals. But there is still a lot of opposition to basic income inside left-wing parties. Some of them assume that the Nordic welfare state, like Finland, as, their, as the only ideal model for us to follow, or they think that basic income is not radical enough to fight against capitalism. On, and on the other hand, the rightists are in favor of basic income in the context of recent automation and digitization and mechanization discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tron. Um, um, uh, I just saw that Natalie has, has answered the first uh, question we had in the chat. Um, which was on mechanization. Uh, would you like to say anything more on that? Or um, sorry, you're on mute there. Yeah, um, I might just respond to Simo saying about universal credit. Yeah, and it's probably worth mentioning that I, I, I've been trying to help the Finnish Greens get this message through, and I'm not sure it has got through to Finland or other places in the rest of Europe, but universal credit is very widely regarded in Britain as an absolute disaster. Um, and that's even by people who aren't necessarily on our side of politics. The practical reality is certainly in places like Britain with zero hours contracts, with people getting into their employment in and out of employment, um, low wages, complex lives. Um, universal credit just cannot keep up. And it really demonstrates you know, these two problems, I think, with conditionality of benefits. One is the fact that there are always people missing out. And the two is the fact that lives now are just too complex to, to, to match up to any sort of standard. And so we've got people being hugely overpaid and then asked to pay money back, people being hugely underpaid, um, people just clearly being desperately left with not enough money to live on. The system does not work. And that's without even mentioning the fact that the computer system totally doesn't work. So it, it's an utterly failed model, universal credit. I just want to, um, thanks for that. I just wanted to offer the chance to, um, I, I was going to try and pronounce that, but username SSYX um, to come in. And um, if you want to expand on your point or your question, um, then please, welcome, uh, feel welcome to. Okay, um, otherwise I will, um, I know that Simo would like to come in here, so I'll just pass it over to Simo to continue the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that uh, in, let's say, kind of the researchers here in Finland, we know quite well that the situation or kind of universal credit in uh, the UK has been a failure. It was also the case that it, or kind of two points that I want to bring up from it. One is kind of the point of conditionality, which I said that is very important kind of when we are discussing merging certain benefits and putting a single taker rate in. Uh, one thing that uh, has been, I think, true of the universal credit in United Kingdom is that uh, it also put conditionality on people already in work. And for all, while kind of the idea was that it's going to help working poor, 
because they will get kind of this a taper rated kind of uh, <coughs> benefit. It also meant that they would still have to uh, engage in the bureaucracy. So it did not decrease bureaucracy. Uh, the other other point I want to make is uh, about about kind of the how it was uh, coincided with austerity measures. That of course, of course, it's if 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 it's uh, if it cuts the benefits, if the benefits are being cut at the same time, it's going to leave people worse off. And now, especially now when the rollout is still going on and people are uh, uncertain of whether they should. Uh, go to universal credit or stay kind of in the current system. And then those early adopters are being, are losing even thousands of pounds a year, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. But still it's the case that the kind of the basic idea of merging the benefits and putting a single paper rate is uh, kind of the dominant idea in the big Finnish parties. And uh, I, I would also argue that it, that it that it could be made more humane if it can be kind of linked a little bit towards more like a basic income like model with uh, decreasing conditionality and uh, less red tape. Yeah, I think um, with. Uh... All, all kind of reforms, the context of how they're done is very important. In the UK, the coincidence, as you say, of austerity with this uh, universal credit and not just a coincidence, universal credit being used as a tool to further that um, austerity is uh, one of the reasons for it, why it hasn't worked and why it is, uh, why it is just uh, putting people into real suffering and difficulty in the UK. Um, I wanted to uh, pose a question we just received through the chat box. So each one, um, the one of our participants, like you to elaborate more on the the criticism that UBI uh, activists or advocates sometimes get that somehow this isn't radical enough, and mm. it's not confronting capitalism. And uh, and how do you deal with that? Well, I think basic income is so great way and very effective way to combat capitalism because first it's it's a great way to dis distribute the wealth of uh, our society and in a more cultural way uh, i think basic income help us to uh, imagine alternative system and it help us to make uh, make a question like Mm, what kind of society, alternative society, do you want to live? And what kind of, uh, and it suggests us to imagine what kind of society we should construct to have basic income. I think that kind of society is, isn't like the capitalist society. So I think through the basic income, uh, we can expect the individual's autonomy and and uh, we can we can invent new agencies uh, that can combat capitalism, uh, starting with the individuals. And only through that way we can make another change, another society. Because these days in a capitalist society, we don't have any time, and that means and we don't have any money because money is time in this society. So I think basic income can give people, individuals a free time to try, try to, um, try to make, a, a try to be an activist or try to make a, a labor unions like that. I see. I see. Natalie would like to come in there. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. If I can just follow that, because I think it fits quite nicely. I was talking to a young Polish activist, the University.
versus where he didn't come. And interestingly, he was saying that his problem was from the other side of this, that people were saying to him as soon as he suggested it, oh, well, that's communist and we discarded communism. And I kind of, talking to him, developed some thinking and a structure that if we think about under capitalism, it is the employer, the capitalist, the man in the terms of the song who decides your income, decides if you get an income. Um, under very statist communist type systems, the state controlled your income. If we think about universal basic income that some, comes to you as a right, you're, this is part of your share of the wealth of society and it comes to you automatically. Then what we're actually doing is freeing up the individual and giving the individual the chance to make their choices about how they spend their life, how they spend their time, how they contribute. So you, it really is absolutely radical and revolutionary and creates a society unlike anything we've seen before. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question through um, from, from Lucas. Um, and he's asking what kind of stepping stones towards UBI are being planned and developed. Um, so I'm, I'm British, but I live in Belgium. And one of the examples of that I can give here is that the Belgium is regionally and also its Green Party is a split between uh, French speaking, Dutch speaking, and Ecuador, the Dutch speaking Greens had a proposal for in the last manifesto for basic income for. Um, people between, I think it was between the age of 24 and 20, no, sorry, 18 and 24, basically between the school leaving age and leaving university age. And it was, the, the, the point was that this is a critical moment whether someone goes on to higher education or whether they don't go on to higher education. It's a very important moment of transition in your life. And it's a moment where um, inequalities and opportunities can really limit the choices you make. So even though their long-term aspiration is for uh, a full basic income for all, this was their proposal for this particular election for um, the introduction of a, a form of basic income, as they saw it. Um, I would just like to ask whether in the UK, um, Simo, or, or Simo, you mentioned that it was being considered in um, Finland a, a smaller amount of basic income than first proposed by the Greens. Maybe you could expand on that as a, as a kind of stepping stone that Lucas is asking about. Yeah, but uh, I sort of think that Lucas would be the right person to answer that because he's uh, actually working for BC at the Green Foundation and had recent a report kind of uh, looking into that idea of a smaller basic income. But uh, to stress one point kind of why, why kind of... Uh, Lucas has been looking into this and why this is being discussed as part of uh, part of a goal. One one stepping goal would be could be if uh, an universal credit could be done as with an unconditional uh, part of it, so that there is some part of benefit that you get regardless of whether you follow a certain plan or something like that. Of course, it would have to come into fruition in a manner that uh, it does not kind of take away any current benefits, but is just kind of as a floor underneath them. It would create some flexibility for people, for example, uh, in between of different, uh, different uh, benefits. And uh, another kind of point to stress that uh, I've, I think that it would be interesting to hear is that uh, if uh, if in your country the push is for a partial basic income and not kind of a full basic income enough to live on by itself, which we would talk about something like, I don't know, depends on the country, something that also takes care of your housing and also cares, takes care of different uh, situations and your, all your basic needs, that kind of full basic income uh, could replace most basic benefits or kind of could only live in place kind of uh, like benefits for uh, people on the way and totally uh, yeah, unable to work. But if we talk about 
a partial basic income, as has been the discussion in Finland most often, then we also need to think about how to click the basic income into the existing benefit system, what benefits it replaces, how does it fit in with other services, uh, and for example, how does it fit in with the housing allowance. But as I, as I said, Lucas has uh, kind of looked into this more than myself. Okay, thanks for that. I'd also like to pass that over to Juan to maybe you could expand on the idea for a youth UBI that you mentioned in your, your opening comments and how that would work. Uh, yes, the youth basic income is actually close to social dividend and its special point is it's, it is paid in a local currency because its policy goal of Core is revitalize the local economy and it's largely supported by local small business owners. And, but I think this kind of uh, stepping stone uh, works because in terms of publicizing basic income, because I'm, the Gyeonggi province I mentioned is very big city in Korea. So um, many young people are benefiting from the program and it's quite sizable, one, uh, 175,000 young people. And so more and more discussions are taking place as more people are going to experience this policy both directly and indirectly. And this policy was um, driven by the governor's strong uh, commitment to basic income. So it shows that basic income is not mainly about uh, financial feasibility, but it's about um, social consensus and political will. So considering the basic income pilot program is increasing around the world, it, I think it is really meaningful that this program is not only an experiment, but also an actual implementation. So um, starting from this kind of very small uh, use, use basic income, we can go further by expanding it to the other generation or the other uh, local government. I hope so. So yeah, a kind of incremental approach to bringing a basic income rather than introducing it all in one go. Um, Maybe I'd just like to bring in Natalie here because uh, there's been some, there's been a question through about what can be done, uh, what can an activist do? Basic income. Um, you said talk about it as much as possible, but are there any other guidance about how to talk about it? Um, you know, you've done a lot of um, talking um, with, um, with skeptics of basic income, trying to convince them. So what kind of tips do you have? One of the things is Natalie, your video is Natalie, we have a delay on your video. I'm um, trying to see that whole sound. So you're not coming through clearly for us at this stage. Okay, one more go. Yeah, um, let's try it. Maybe take your video off just in case it's a connection problem and just try speaking. Okay, I'll try speaking. Yeah, how's that going? Much better. Okay, um, what should you do? Um, I would say stress that universal basic income is not the answer to everything. You know, some of the feminist critics of UBI will say, oh, it could entrench women into caring roles, jobs in society of caring for old and young people and that. And it's not the case that you can bring in UBI and that fixes everything else. You've got to fight lots of other battles in society as well. So you need to fight to keep or amend, improve universal services. Um, it's not... You know, I always say to anyone who says, I've got one thing that will solve society's problems, always is very skeptical about that. 
and it's important to suggest that UBI is, I think, a necessary condition for a decent, fair, sustainable society. But it's by no means at all the only condition to create that sort of society. It's one building block of a much bigger whole. Jamie, we have a, um, thanks Natalie. Uh, we, Jamie, we have a question from uh, Maria who wants to ask a verbal question. Um, so I'm gonna take her off mute. And Kelly uh, Yen also asked a question online just for the speakers to keep in the back of their mind as they're answering is um, recently the US Democratic candidate uh, came out in support of Elon Musk suggesting uh, that the basic income be financed by companies, by taxing companies. And so something that she was interested in is what are the proposals around how governments finance this with kind of various constraints on their budgets? Um, so Maria, I'm gonna take you off mute unless you already are off mute. Uh, and I can't see Maria. Oh, there you are, you're off mute. Perfect, go for it, Maria. Hi, um, I'm from Greece. Uh, you may know already that we had a left government for uh, almost five years or something. And they were promoting an idea. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, yes, okay. we hear you. Very so well. they were they, they, amidst this terrible crisis that we are still in. They were very much promoting this idea of a of a of a state that uh, gives people basic income and basic goods in the sense not only of money but of uh, prepaid credit in the supermarkets and. Uh, uh, lower uh, electricity bills and whatever. Uh, this, well, in, in this crisis uh, environment did work, did help people, but there was a, a big concern, and that's my question, uh, whether this makes all of us extremely dependent from the state and any government. I mean, I, I understand that the idea behind the, the basic income is independence, but who is going to distribute that and how? How, how I mean, in, in the future, how much we will be more governized as countries than we are now if, if we are going to get uh, substantial money for, for living? Yeah, that's my question. And which of our participants would like to come in on that? The question of will it make us too dependent on the state? Will There's also a link to the question received in the chat of shall we make companies pay for it? Um, but then a risk comes with that that um, the people aren't making their own money through their own work, but perhaps they are just receiving a... Um, a sum based on taxation of companies rather than generating their own wealth. So um, Natalie's put her hand up, so I'd like to bring her in here. Okay, I think this is a really good and important question, but we can look to the case study of New Zealand, which kind of already has a partial universal basic income in that it has the pension that's going to everyone of pension age who's been in the country for a relatively short period of time. And that doesn't rely on your previous contributions as say pensions in Britain rely on your previous contributions. And, and New Zealand at times has had very neoliberal left-wing governments that have tried to move towards ending this universal pension. Um, and there's been huge public resistance to them. So one of the things about universal benefits is once they come in, there's a huge interest in society, a political interest in supporting them, in keeping them, in fighting for them. Whereas partial benefits, conditional benefits, only some people benefit for, and often they're the people with the least social power, least political power in society. So again, you universal basic income doesn't guarantee things, but it gives you something really powerful and really important to fight for that everyone can understand and everyone benefits from.
Thanks for that, Nat. I'd just like to ask if there are any more questions um, from the participants or if anyone else would like to take the floor. Um, if, if that's everything, I'll just, uh, just give you a, a minute or so, but then I just ask each of our participants maybe to make a very quick uh, wrap up. We're coming up to the hour mark now and we were, said we'll have a 45 minute session to start off with. So um, yeah, if we have no additional questions, then maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll start with Joan and, that, and ask her if she has any final comments to make at the end of this session. Also, oh, I see uh, Amy's coming in. Just, just something that I'd be curious about in the closing remarks um, would be a statement of the vision of what society looks like with a universal basic income. Something that strikes me as interesting with this conversation is distinguishing it between something that people need and something that creates new possibilities of freedom for individual and human expression. And I feel like that powerful vision of what it could mean to be human is something that is maybe sometimes lacking in and in or something that would be interesting to have in some of your closing statements of like the vision of what does your society or our society look like with that universal basic income in place can i start now yes please. okay okay <laughs> um, I, I think the spectrum of basic income is very wide, but I believe it is a green issue. It should be the green issue. I sincerely hope that the basic income will be an idea that help us to overcome the climate crisis. Like the Green Party Korea have, are talking nowadays about the new, um, new social contract to be presented to break the social link among wage labor, economic growth, and quality of life. And then furthermore, we are trying to persuade that the logic of regulation to cope with the climate change is to ensure safety and freedom in the lives of individuals. It could be possible that the Green Party's basic income will be um, repositioned regarding this point, I mean, uh, through the carbon tax and dividend. So today I'm really happy to um, to be here. It would be really nice to see more stories linking basic income to green issues. And thanks for inviting me again. Okay, th thank you, John. Um, we have. Uh, I'm going to pass it through to Simo and Natalie uh, for closing statements. But we've also had a last question through from Richard. So if I review how many any reflections on that and the question is really asking uh, how could um, we think about designing a UBI system so it not to create uh, a position where people are somehow made redundant or um, that, that they become dependent on UBI is there a way that it could be set up uh, rich mentions beyond government um, potentially um, that we could think about a UBI system to ensure that that risk didn't happen. Um, who would like to start, either Seymour or Natalie? Seymour? <clears throat> yeah, I think that uh, I'm, I'm not the most radical UBI thinker, and I think Natalie answers this pretty well. The main thing is that because basic income makes it all of the members of the society, its uh, stakeholders, it, uh, it does kind of uh, it, it, it tends to be kind of a result kind of in social public policy studies that if you have more universal benefits, people are less, less inclined to cut from them. But if you have as more kind of marginal benefits that are only paid for a small group of people who don't much have much political power, then it's going to be more easily reduced, as Natalie said. So I would kind of say that that's the main point. Should I also go for the closing remarks? Yes, if you'd like to, yeah. I have to say that I really also kind of find the carbon fee and dividend idea very kind of interesting. And the other similar idea relates to kind of uh, economic downturns and uh, kind of the role of the central banks, whether we could 
give so-called helicopter money to people when in, in those situations instead of uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> bailing out the banks just to kind of exaggerate the point uh, otherwise I, I think that my basic income kind of utopia would not be that different from today. it would be easier for people to uh, make life choices make changes in their lives make different decisions uh, do voluntary work but uh, people would still do jobs people even though they're would be automation people would still have jobs at uh, fixing fixing the automated machines and stuff like that and also kind of uh, it, the carbon fee and dividend idea is kind of one of the more interesting kind of European ideas at the European level currently because because we kind of need something to support people in the green transition we cannot uh, we have to transfer wealth from those who have to those who need. Thanks for that. I think um, the idea of in, in a crisis using the central bank uh, and helicopter money is something that sounded uh, crazy a few years ago, but now you hear um, you know, the financial press discussing it regularly. So I think in, in future, that alongside the climate dividend is really something that could come into I'd like to pass it over to, to Natalie now. Okay, well, to start with Amy's question about what does society look like, I often say that one disbenefit of a universal basic income society is you would get a lot of really bad poetry written because lots of people would feel like their career in life was, you know, they wanted to become a poet, that was their vocation. One of the good things about bad poetry is it has a really low carbon footprint because no one wants to read it, so, no, so you don't even have to print it. Um, but more seriously, you would also get some wonderful poetry written that isn't written now and music um, performed and wonderful small businesses started. So you really are unleashing people's creativity. Um, I think picking up off what Yuan said about um, economic growth. People now are told that, oh, we've got to, lots of people will get crumbs from the table of economic growth and if we grow the economy, the crumb get bigger, there's more crumbs. Um, what universal basic income offers is, is we know we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, but we can give everyone genuine security of knowing they'll get an adequate slice of the pie to live a basically decent life. And in terms of the questions we've been asking about power and governments, I've got a saying that politics should be something you do, not have done to you. But when I say that to many public audiences, you can see lots of people in the room kind of shrink down and their shoulders go down. And they say, you know, you're asking me to do something else and I'm already doing a full-time job and I'm looking after the children and I'm looking after my elderly parents. Where am I going to find the time to do politics or the energy and the universal income a society could potentially be a far far more politically engaged society and that could be a huge positive so more poetry and more politics i think that's a great vision okay thank you i think that's an um, excellent inspiring point to leave on we've had a a couple of final points but um one on saying basic income alongside uh, of the policies and of one about the rate. Um, we won't have time to address everything today. It's a really massive de debate. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the, all the participants and also say that um, on the Green uh, European Journal, uh, we've, for the past uh, three years, we've been regularly publishing on, um, on um, universal basic income. Seymour's point uh, article published just today has a point on what he was talking about as basic income in relation to other um, in real the the rest of the welfare state and how it should interact. So um, there's a lot of material there looking at the questions of how much basic income should be and how should it fit into existing systems. So um, yeah, for more there you can go to um, GreenEuropeanJournal.eu.
Um, and apart from that, I would just like to reiterate our thanks on behalf of the European Journal um, to all our participants and to our speakers and, uh, and my co-host, Amy. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Um, I just popped the Facebook event page link into our chat box. So for conversations to keep going there amongst the participants. Like I said, we recorded the webinar, so I'll also post that and I'll send an email out to those that registered, registered on our website um, with some of the key questions that came out and topics. So um, we'll try and keep this topic active and live and figure out different ways of doing that. So stay tuned and I'll keep you all in the loop. Uh, thanks to the speakers. It was brilliant, wonderful, such amazingly deep thinking and to the participants who all seem to be experts in their own right as well. So thanks for your wonderful questions and um, we'll close it there. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you.